On our newscast tonight, President Obama and U.S. President Barack Obama meet and talk on the sidelines of the APEC summit in Beijing. They discuss North Korea and a wide range of bilateral issues. The captain of the now sunken several ferry avoids death sentence. He abandons ship while hundreds remain on board. He is sentenced to just 36 years in jail, while the government announces its ending of underwater search for the victims. A suicide bomb attack targeting a Nigerian boarding school kills at least 48 people. Boko Haram militants are immediately suspected. We have these and more coming up in early edition at 6. Hello and welcome to Early Edition at 6. It's Tuesday, November 11th here in Seoul. I'm Nahyan Gyal. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. We begin in Beijing, where President Bakunin and U.S. President Barack Obama held summit talks on the sidelines of the APEC summit on this Tuesday. That's right. Korea's presidential office spokesperson Min Gyeong-uk says the two leaders discussed a range of issues of interest to both sides. An official who attended the summit said the two presidents spent a good amount of time engaged in useful discussions. It's likely that those centered around the security situation on the Korean Peninsula and the North Korean human rights issues. And one of the main points of conversation at this year's APEC summit in Beijing has been China's vision for a regional trade bloc called the Free Trade Area of the Asia Pacific. On Tuesday, President Park Geun-hye spoke about those plans and pledged Korea's full support, but there are questions about what that might mean for security diplomacy in Northeast Asia. Kwon Soa reports. President Park Geun-hye expressed support for China's vision for creating a trade bloc in the Asia-Pacific region at an APEC session on Tuesday. The FTAAP is the 21-member APEC's ultimate goal, with a main focus of reducing trade restrictions. And in order to reduce the gap between the free trade negotiating capabilities of member countries, President Park suggested launching projects to bridge those gaps starting in 2015. Now the focus is on how President Park's support for the FTAAP may or may not have an effect on security diplomacy in Northeast Asia, as well as the global economic competition between China and the United States. This, as the FTAAP is often compared to the U.S.-led Trans-Pacific Partnership, which excludes China. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, with the gate to the world's largest consumer market set to be opened, Korea's service industries are gearing up to seize the moment. Following the announcement of the Korea-China Free Trade Pact on Monday, local banks are also getting ready for more yuan-based transactions. Our Song ji has this report. Korea's service industries that will gain access to China's 1.4 billion consumers range from travel and leisure to finance and distribution sectors. The free trade deal also allows Korean law firms to set up joint ventures with their Chinese counterparts in Shanghai's free trade zone, while Korean entertainment companies can hold stakes of up to 49 percent of Chinese entities. Beijing, which has pledged to ease regulations to allow Korean participation in building up China's public telecommunications networks, will explore ways to expand service sector cooperation between the two nations. We will have more opportunities to gain greater access to the service sector, as follow-up negotiations will take place over the next two years, after the free trade deal takes effect. Korean banks are also preparing for the increased need to settle bilateral trade in their own currencies. Seoul and Beijing have earlier agreed to open a direct U.N. trading market in the Korean capital next month. The Chinese currency now accounts for a mere 1.2 percent of payments made to settle two-way trade that totaled $228 billion last year. 
The Korean government's goal is to raise that portion of yuan-based settlement to 20 percent next year. In the coming month, local banks will also launch savings plans in the Chinese yuan with an annual interest rate of 3 percent, nearly double the interest paid for local currency-based savings accounts. Song ji -sun, Arirang News. Korea's reliance on China for growth is only expected to grow with their recently agreed upon bilateral free trade agreement. This is especially true for the nation's 200 top companies that are already very active in China. Between 2011 and 2013, their combined sales jumped 35 percent to more than 133 billion U.S. dollars there. Samsung Electronics seems to have benefited the most from Korea's blossoming trade relationship with China. The firm's sales spiked to $36.6 billion in 2013. That's up 74 percent from 2011. Experts say Korean exporters need to focus more on premium high-tech products and consumer goods to better tap into China's domestic market, rather than depending too much on intermediate goods. Foreign fan base of Korean products continues to grow. It first started with clothes, then they shift their sights to cosmetics, and now it's spreading to food. Our Shin se reports on why more and more consumers overseas are clicking the mouse to buy Korean goods online. November 11th is celebrated as Pepero Day in Korea, as the Pepero snack resembles the ones in the date. Used as a marketing tool by the manufacturer Lotte Confectionery, the sales of the pepero sticks fly off the shelves once early November rolls around each year, and the popularity has expanded to other countries. According to online retail shopping mall G Market, sales of pepero have topped the list of processed food products over the past month in its global shop. But the growth expands far beyond pepero. Last month, the total sales of Korean processed food surged over 160 percent on month. The G Market Global Shop, which reported a 57 percent sales jump in the first 10 months of this year, offers food items ranging from chocolate and instant noodles to seasoned labor, red chili paste, and even fermented seafood. I regularly purchase salt fermented seafood online. It was a little difficult to get my hands on it, but now it only takes three to five days to get when I buy it online. Online retail shopping malls are boosting services to accelerate the market. Maltail, a direct purchasing website, recently partnered up with the Korea Postal Service, making shipping easier for a number of products, even fresh produce. Considering that the majority of the shopping exports are being made to China and the level of their spending on Korean products, whether it be cosmetics or pepero, the sales will most likely surge. If their interest in Korean food products continues, it will definitely influence Korea's food industry. And since Korea and China have concluded FTA negotiations on a deal that will remove tariffs on most products, more Chinese customers are expected to log into Korean online retailers to fill up their shopping carts. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The momentum of Korea's economic recovery is not proving strong enough to offset uh, the downside risks. That's how the finance ministry assesses the situation in its monthly report. It says job creation and employment rates are expanding, but the pace of recovery is sluggish because of low inflation and a drop in consumer prices over the past two months. Now, the government also cited risks stemming from overseas, including the weak Japanese yen, deflation woes in the eurozone, and the U.S. Federal Reserve's recent decision to end its quantitative easing. The report comes ahead of the Bank of Korea's monthly monetary meeting slated for Thursday. The central bank is widely expected to keep its interest rate frozen at 2 percent after cutting it by 25 basis points last month. An official full stop to the search operations for missing victims of the Seoul Ferry disaster. The announcement was made earlier today. Connie Kim has reports on the government's decision made upon the request of the victims' families. The underwater search operations for missing victims of the Seoul Ferry disaster has come to an end, despite nine people still being unaccounted for. Oceans and Fisheries Minister Lee Ju Young announced Tuesday morning that the government made the decision upon the request of victims' families. 
We are announcing that the underwater search operations that continued for more than 200 days are being stopped. I sincerely regret calling off the operations without recovering all those unaccounted for. Minister Lee said that parts of the hull are collapsing and that dropping water temperatures are making operations difficult and dangerous for divers. He added there was little possibility of recovering additional victims. Measures aimed at preventing bodies from drifting out of the sunken ferry will also come to an end. The emergency management headquarters in Chindo, the closest point of land to the accident site, will scale back operations and soon dissolve. Although underwater search operations have come to an end, victims' families are not giving up hope of finding their loved ones. They requested that the government fully review the options of raising the vessel, calling it a final means to finding the nine who remain missing. Relatives also called on the government to keep them informed throughout the process. The minister said the Central Disaster Management Headquarters will decide on when to start raising the ferry from the seafloor after discussions with experts and relatives of the victims. That decision is likely to come after the Seoul Ferry Law takes effect. The law aims to uncover the causes of the disaster, which left more than 300 people dead. The last victim recovered from the vessel came late last month. Before that, no one had been found inside the sunken ferry since July. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Staying on that topic, the captain of the Seoul Ho, who abandoned ship and his sense of responsibility on that fateful day in April, avoided the death penalty. Lee Jun Sok was instead sentenced to 36 years in prison. Others in his crew will also spend time behind bars. Our Kim Yeon-bin reports on Tuesday's court verdict. A district court in Gwangju on Tuesday sentenced Lee Jun Sok, the captain of the Seoul Ho Ferry, to 36 years in prison for abandoning ship at the time of the deadly sinking. He was, however, acquitted of murder charges, meaning he avoids the death penalty, which prosecutors had pushed for. The court said in their ruling that there wasn't enough evidence to convict E of murder. They said the prosecution had failed to prove that E was aware his actions would lead to the deaths of people on board. In the same ruling, the ferry's chief engineer, identified only by his family name, Pak, was convicted of murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was found responsible for not helping two crew members who later died in the ferry escape. Thirteen other crew members were given sentences ranging between 5 and 20 years on charges of abandoning ship and violations of ship safety protocol. Prosecutors pinned most of the blame for the deaths of 300 plus people in the ferry disaster on Yi and his crew as they told passengers to stay in the cabins while the crew hurriedly left the sinking ferry. Tuesday's verdicts bring the five-month trial to a close. Prosecutors say they will appeal Tuesday's court decision on all 15 crew members. The ruling came hours after the Korean government ended a seven-month underwater search inside the sunken Cerro Hole ferry. The 6,800-ton ferry sank on April 16th off Korea's southwestern coast. The death toll in the tragedy currently stands at 295, with nine still missing. Kim Young Bin, Adia News. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best. With Na Hyung Kyung and Daniel Che. Arirang News. Arirang News. Arirang News. Arirang News. On early edition at 6. In what is shaping up to be one of the bloodiest school attacks in Nigeria to date, a suicide bomber targeted a boarding school, killing nearly 50 students and injuring dozens more. Son Jung In reports. The blast that tore through an assembly hall at the Government Science Secondary School in Nigeria's northeastern town of Potiskam was the seventh attack this year on a school in the country. Police say a suicide bomber who was disguised as a student set off the explosion just outside the principal's office where students had gathered for a daily speech. Dozens were killed, all believed to be between the ages of 11 and 20. In a statement, UN Secretary General Pan Ki moon strongly condemned the deadly attack and called for the perpetrators to be brought to justice. 
The Secretary General is outraged by the frequency and brutality of attacks against educational institutions in the north of the country and reiterates his demand for an immediate cessation to these abominable crimes. Although no one immediately claimed responsibility for the attack, Boko Haram militants are suspected. The extremist group has targeted schools in its five-year insurrection that aims to build an Islamic state in which boys receive only Islamic education and girls do not attend school. In reaction to the latest bombing, local authorities ordered the immediate closure of all public schools near the town and called on the central government to help bring an end to the escalating violence. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. The U.S. Special Envoy on North Korean Human Rights, Robert King, arrived in Seoul on this Tuesday. He is expected to further pressure Pyongyang on its human rights violations together with the U.N. Special Rapporteur on North Korea. Hwang Sung-hee has this next report. Washington's Special Envoy on North Korean Human Rights Issues, Robert King, arrived in Seoul Tuesday amid growing international attention on Pyongyang's dire human rights situation. During his three-day stay, King will meet with South Korean officials and attend a human rights forum. His trip coincides with a visit to Seoul by the UN Special Rapporteur on North Korea, Marzuki Darusman, and is largely focused on the ongoing UN moves to take the North Korean regime to the International Criminal Court on allegations of human rights violations. A draft resolution is expected to be adopted by the General Assembly's Third Committee as early as next week. It should then be officially approved by the UN General Assembly in December. And North Korea seems to have wrapped up its rare diplomatic charm offensive. In a statement given to UN member states last month, Pyongyang said that as of October 31st, it was suspending all talks on the draft resolution that urges the Security Council to consider sending North Korea to the ICC. The statement also warned those supporting the move will have to take full responsibility for the consequences that follow. Nonetheless, diplomats working with North Korean officials say the regime has become genuinely concerned about the recent UN moves zooming in on its human rights situation. Hwang sang Arirang News. A growing number of North Koreans are apparently heading to China in search of work. The Beijing Bureau of the Korea International Trade Association says some 93,000 North Korean workers crossed into China last year. It says more North Koreans seem to be crossing the border to obtain foreign currency and that China welcomes them because they provide cheap labor. The figure has increased by an average of nearly 20 percent annually since 2000. 2010. That's in sharp contrast to the number of migrant workers from other countries, which grew just 9 percent during the same period. About 44,000 North Korean workers crossed into China in the first half of this year. An iconic Korean singer named Lee Seung Chul was denied entry into Japan this past weekend. A number of reports say the refusal could have something to do with a concert he performed in Korea's easternmost Tokdo Island, which Tokyo continues to make false claims too. Our Park Ji-won has the story. The concert at the root of the controversy took place on Korea's Tokdo Island a day before Liberation Day in August. Lee seung was there to sing his new song that day with a choir made up of teenage North Korean defectors. Fast forward a few months and the 47-year-old set off for a trip to Japan on November 9th. However, upon his arrival at Tokyo's Haneda Airport, the singer was detained for four hours at the airport's immigration office. Various media outlets report that when Lee was asked why he was being held, an official said it was due to recent media exposure, presumably in reference to his Tokyo concert. Lee was said to be furious about his treatment and when he threatened to expose what had happened. Japanese officials said his entrance had been denied based on his past use of marijuana more than 20 years ago. Despite the immigration office's claim, Lee has entered Japan more than 15 times since his arrest for marijuana use in Korea in the early 1990s. He even held a concert in Japan in the 2000s. Following the incident, 
Lee cancelled his schedule in Japan and is now taking a break in Korea. Lee's agency says the singer believes the retaliatory denial of entrance was due to his concert on Tokdo, which Japan falsely claims to be its territory. This is not the first time that a Korean star involved in a Tokdo-related campaign has been discriminated against in Japan. Korean star Song Il-guk, who participated in a swimming project to Tokdo in 2012, was warned that he might experience problems if he tries to enter Japan, and the drama Song acted in was pulled off from the airwaves in Japan six days before it was due to premiere. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. In response to the incident, Korea's foreign ministry said Tuesday that a Korean consul in Japan inquired about the matter with Japanese authorities. Uh, the response was that they couldn't give a specific reason for why he was denied entry into Japan due to privacy policies. The Korean foreign ministry spokesperson said, if what media outlets have reported turns out to be true, it's a very regrettable event. Let's shift gears to a different story now. During this time of the year, couples and families crowd Cheonggyecheon stream in Seoul to catch a brilliant lantern festival. Our immunity takes us to that scene and to other gallery exhibitions you might want to pay a visit to this month. Take a look. Every November since 2009, the streets of Seoul are lit up brilliantly by lanterns. Creations of all different shapes and sizes, made by professional artists as well as by everyday citizens. The Seoul Lantern Festival brings a community together through a unique and dazzling blend of the traditional and modern, and an eye-catching display along Cheonggyecheon Stream in Seoul. Millions of spectators gather from all over the country and the world to see this landmark spectacle of handcrafted lanterns, each created under this year's theme of World Heritage Shining in Seoul, which highlights Seoul's history for friends and family alike. A deer in headlights. Hundreds and hundreds of headlights. Artist Che Uram is known for melding technology and art for futuristic-like works, including this mammoth orb of car headlights that leaves viewers frozen in their tracks. It's part of a collection of works reflecting the dreams of nine artists, with the exotic and the unknown mixed in with the world we live in. The exhibition is part of the Hyundai Motors' brilliant art project. And while some artists dream of a future world, some find creative inspiration in everyday items, like a handbag. Bag is Literature brings together three prize novelists and displays their unique interpretations of the literary world, stitched into the linings of a purse. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Now the weather, typical late autumn conditions continue here in Korea, but we're getting higher than normal levels of fine dust. Mm, that's right. Let's uh, turn to our Kim Bo-kyung at the Weather Center for more Bo-kyung. Good evening, guys. Well, those with respiratory problems should take caution as fine dust readings are higher than normal levels. Readings are at 80 micrograms per cubic meter here in Seoul and is gradually increasing. Over to our satellite map. At the moment, we are under cloudy skies nationwide and more clouds are set to move in, leading to showers in parts of Gyeonggi-do province later tonight. As for tomorrow, it looks like we'll need an umbrella in the morning. About 5 millimeters of precipitation is forecast nationwide. Although it won't be much, the rainfall may be accompanied by strong winds and stormy conditions in the central regions. Looking ahead, tomorrow's rainfall will pull down numbers on Thursday, which is college entrance exam day here in Korea. Morning lows should drop to minus 2 before reaching up to 6 in the afternoon. Here are the readings for tomorrow. Seoul peaks at 10 Daegu and Gwangju, the mid-teens, and Busan at 17. On to other regions, Daejeon reaches 11, Jeju 16, and the morning low on Mount Kumgang drops to minus 15. Those are the updates we're following at this hour. Here's a look at the international weather.
But that's all we have for you at this hour. Thank you for staying with us. If you're tuning in from different time zones, have a wonderful day. This has been Daniel Tre. And I'm Nai Hyun Gyung. If you're tuning in from Korea, have a great evening. Daniel and I will be back same time tomorrow.